Uh, alrighty. Um, I am Jack's lack of acclaimed leading performances. And I am Jack's lack of a screenplay credit. <laughs> well, and we are. It's we're talking about the fucking Hulk. It's marvelous episode two, and we're talking about uh, the most forgotten entry in the whole uh, what would become the MCU. I think, like, no, I don't think anybody remembers this movie. Well, op- for obvious reasons, because um, a Edward Norton was recast at, with a. Uh, uh, Mark Ruffalo, and B, this was completely overshadowed by Iron Man, which came out just a couple months before or something like that. Um, and also because there had just been like another Hulk movie like three years before that was also bad. It, I haven't seen the Angley Hulk, but I saw it here. It's very dour. I saw it when it came out, and yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's far too austere and it lacks um like the hulk action like in this movie i think some of the hulk action is pretty good uh it's a mixed bag uh in that respect that ang lee movie there's very little of it it's it's not great and then like the big climactic fight which is honestly like the climactic fights usually the least interesting part of any of these movies, but it's like oh this especially I checked out yeah oh yeah it, it boring well I checked out at the terrible romance like that was that was when I was just like this is this is getting real rough but yeah the stupid CGI monster fight I was like I'm done it just I. I'm just gonna assume everybody. Yeah, I'll 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 try this time. I'll succeed. I'll do just like a thirty second plot summary. Um, the movie, and then yeah, and then presumably, like we could go sort of in into the details. Yeah, and, and then we can kind of not quite scene by scene, but like chunk by chunk because the first thirty minutes of this movie, I actually kind of enjoyed. Like they got some, like I was messaging you about you know, potential ways this story would go. And I got really excited and they didn't go that way, but it was at least interesting enough to be engaging because I wanted to know, are they going to take it this stupid direction? Oh, this is kind of interesting. Are they going to go with this angle? And then it's just, just boring. Yeah. Boring (laughs) romance. Boring. So, um, okay. Sorry. Uh, we dispense with the Hulk's origin story in the intro. It kind of feels like a TV show intro where they just like summarize. It's, it's the, all cobbled the origin. together in the credit sequence. Yeah, which which is fine, honestly. Everybody kind of oh, yeah. knows we just had we know that Eric it's like Spider Man. Like we know Peter Parker gets bit by the fucking spider. We know the uh, carjacker kills Uncle Ben. We fucking know. We know that. Like, and again, a Hulk movie had just come out three years before. So why? Why show audiences what they already know? Yeah, so that was the mistake, I guess, with the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies too. Oh well, because, we'll we'll have to do those. I think actually to uh, digress, I think Amazing Spider-Man Two is hysterically bad. Like it's it's the fun yeah, kind of bad. Like it's really. I I I did see it once. My roommate threw it on TV a little after it came out, and I sat down to watch it, and I was laughing out loud through so much of it. It is really, really stupid. But back to Hulk. Um, Hulk's become Hulk. He's on the run. He killed a few people when he first hulked out, beat up his girlfriend. Girlfriend's dad is a general and he's after him. Uh, Tim Roth is a mercenary, or not a mercenary, just like an epic operator guy. And an, yeah, in the end, he, guy. yeah, in the end, he, 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 wants to f- beat the Hulk in a fight. So he turns into his own kind of monster uh, and have a big fight at the end. Abomination. Yeah. Which is a big stupid lizard, which again, we're already getting to that. You know, they're already repeating sort of the climactic, like, Oh, the big climactic battle is the hero versus a bigger, uglier, stupider version of the hero. It's... Like we got that with Iron Man and we get it again with this. Every, here's the thing that every, like what makes what can what can make superheroes compelling to me is the contrast between them and everybody else. It's it's you know it's it's Superman 
stopping a robbery and they they shoot at him and the bullets aren't effective and, and like it doesn't have the drama the tension of like oh can he die but it, but you can do other things with it that are interesting superhero fights like every every superhero fight i've ever seen in a movie almost um every, every superhero fight where it's like they're both basically the same powers and they're just throwing each other into buildings yeah. at least um just makes me wish I was watching the alley brawl in They Live, which is just two large, strong, otherwise regular guys duking it out in an alleyway for eight minutes. And it's so much more yeah. compelling than every every time some guy in a costume yeah. has thrown another guy in a costume through eight buildings. Because there's and it's, yeah. there's no stakes because you know like nothing they're doing to each other really hurts for 90% exactly. of the fight. Yeah, it doesn't. And of course, like um, famously, we'll we'll get into sort of the um, because the more much more interesting than this movie itself is like the pre-production and the production itself and the post-production, like because some shit went down and part of the you know obvious reason why Edward Norton eventually walked and why um, this kind of became a teaching moment well it's not quite a tg moment because the next movie is iron man 2 to which i understand a lot of people think is a also a mess i not quite, have not as, seen not it. quite as boring as this but i you know what i don't um, know about that i i haven't seen it since it came out but i think iron man 2 is gonna be way more boring to watch than this 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 okay. had its moments and i'll uh, one thing i'll say about this uh, we, oh yeah we said iron man one looked like a movie this or almost look like a movie. This looks like a movie. Like this, the, the. I thought it was too green. I mean, I get, maybe it's, I mean, it's got. Get, that. I get it. I get it. But it's too green. I mean that. And literally, I looked it up, and apparently there was like this is the first movie that had a um got like the green seal of approval for oh, like, being like a very green environmental production. Oh, literally, um, so it's literally <laughs> green, like literally green, but also just like. Every shot, there's just, if not, like, color-graded green, which is, those opening credits are all color-graded, completely green. Um, but, like, a lot of shots will just be, like, just just very pronounced green, and it feels like you're being thwacked over the head with it, at least. But it, it, it does look like a movie. Yeah, it I mean, I thought, I mean, like yeah, there's, movie. it's got the, the 2000s digital color grading, but I thought even within that, like, hate. there's, I don't know, I thought, like, I had, the movies now, they're so smooth is a word I've heard used a lot that I think just captures it. This has, check, I mean, it, this is relative, like, I mean, it's not like it's the most amazing movie ever made, but relative to what the MCU would become, this movie looks pretty good. It's got some some texture, a lot of real location stuff, some solid light. Like uh, yeah. it's got good. Uh, the direction is fine, but like the cinematography is good. They've got a good uh, cinematographer I the on there. Is, oof, just couldn't focus. I mean, for a movie that loses its seam like after thirty minutes and then completely starts flatlining once Liv Tyler and Edward Norton get back together like two very very attractive and at least in my opinion competent more than competent actors just no chemistry comp no chemistry at all um and the director of this i what some fucking french guy uh he's uh, like he's like that did the transporter uh, it's like it's L L L louis letterer or something he's, he signed on for bright too oh good lord they're making a bright too everybody that's so funny um, where is, I had it, uh, I looked Fairy it up. lives don't matter. I, I looked up um, who, who was the director of photography, who I think is like the reason this movie looks um, good. And it's the, it it's like the guy who did. Peter Menzies thank Jr. You. Who did. Spider-Man 2 um, and Die Hard 3, among other films. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing Spider-Man 2, actually. Am I, unless I'm losing my mind, I swear it was no. in there. No, he did, he did. Uh, the remake of When a Stranger Calls, Ooh. Kangaroo Jack, Ooh. Oh, uh, IMDb A Time is, to Kill by Jewel Schumacher. IMDb is a time to kill. I, I have the IMDb tab still open on my phone. It was showing me, I had scrolled over to camera and, and electrical department and didn't realize yes. it had changed credits. So that's that's why I was seeing, that might no, be why I was, I was seeing 
some other credit that wasn't DOP. But I mean, Die Hard Three is uh, a great movie. Um, yeah, but every everything else, I'm just like from my understanding, this guy is kind of shot a lot of turds. Sure, but that's uh, when you're when you're a cinematographer, like you can't. Yeah, that's that's all you can do is just like oh, make was, it look good. No, ish. He was director of photography um, of the New York um, team for Spider-Man. Oh, okay. and he did actually. This cinematographer has an early assistant camera uh, credit in Julia Julian Armstrong's Starstruck, which is a very delightful new wave Australian movie about a uh, new wave girl who becomes a pop singer, and it is delightful. Um, but let's let's get back to the subject at hand. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about these opening credits because I <laughs> I think they're funny <laughs> because it's you, it, they're done by the same guy who um, edited together that um, you know the early Tony Stark sequence where they're at the trade show and they're like a Tony Stark American Patriot weapons dealer. Yeah, they're they're very on the nose. Um it reminded me of a of a TV show intro where you just get like oh, yeah. a summary of the plot of the, of the premise before the episode starts. It really felt like yeah. that. But it also had like the sheen of like this like if I I think I realized with these Marvel movies what their kind of gimmick is is every Except maybe like the big team, like the Avengers, maybe are kind of their own thing. But every every standalone Marvel movie is a pastiche of a genre film, and they've just slotted the superhero into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you know, like Winter Soldier, what, until you get to the ending when it's just normal superhero stuff. The, the Winter Soldier is like a was trying to be like a conspiracy thriller. Um, but at least that Iron Man has is like a direction. Yeah, yeah. You know? But like, I it think has a vision to it. This does not. This like you think it's going to be like, oh, he's just they're going to be chasing him around the world. Like you could think it's going to be like a road tripping sort of like on the run sort of movie, and then it he goes back to New York or just see Liv Tyler, and it just completely starts Virginia to Culver University. Virginia, I don't know if that's a real um, school. Or it was no, I don't think Culver University is a real school. It said it was shot in a lot of it was shot in Toronto. It's but, not um, surprising. Anyways, so the the thing I really wanted to bring up about the opening credits is they throw out a lot of well, first of all, the opening credits to this reminded me a lot of the opening credits to uh uh one of the holy shit movies of the year, Malignant, which has a very stupid opening credit sequence where it's it, it looks like it's straight out of like 2006. Yeah, like this this um, movie just, even more than Iron Man is a 2000s movie like the look and feel oh, of it. Oh, oh my god, is it? Um but <laughs> you get a lot of news clippings that uh <laughs> I wrote one of one of the headlines just says green monster sighting. And so <laughs> to my understanding, at least people are reporting on the Hulk's like Bruce Banner's original freak out as the Hulk as if it was like a uh, Bigfoot sighting or a uh, green monster sighting. If you are a Bostonian like I am, that is the Red Sox mascot. So it's really funny just thinking <laughs> um, <laughs> people were just seeing the just the Red Sox, ma- the stupid green monster Red Sox mascot walking around the just stupid pa- Patterson too. Gimlin footage of him walking through the woods. Yeah. Um, um, and also there is a, uh, like screen that pops up very, it's, it's very quick. Um, and it, it's like a, like a command center or something. Presumably, I think the logo says shield, which it's completely up in the air. What shield sort of role in this whole, I, um, Hulk situation is, I but think- to my understanding, to my understanding, uh, the U.S. Army is specifically requesting anti-Hulk weapons from Stark Industries because a uh, little uh, something that says requisition request, U.S. Army, Stark Industries, and then like a bunch of uh, like plans for those uh, trucks with like the uh, anti-gamma ray guns. Oh, yeah. Those, I thought those are just big fight sound. Pop-up. I thought those yeah. were just big big subwoofers or something um something like that but that's yeah they throw a lot of like well that's i i am a hundred percent that because all all those um references the shield and and stargazer all that those only pop up in like 
CGI shots of computer screens yeah. and like hacker vision stuff. And it's that was all yeah. added in post production after Iron Man was a hit, like the stinger scene with uh, Robert Downey Jr. The the super tacked on stinger scene that they had to apparently retcon with one of the early Marvel shorts because I guess an Iron again we're gonna watch Iron Man two next, but um, uh, Tony Stark's relationship with Shield is a lot more tenuous in Iron Man two. They kind of see him as a bit of a threat, or his his like whole personality and cult and like celebrity as you know, a threat to, like, sort of the covertness of S.H.I.E.L.D., I suppose. And And so it wouldn't make sense for Tony Stark to go to fucking uh, William Hurt, uh, General Ross, to be like, we're putting a team together. And so they they literally retconned that as, like, oh, no, we sent him there so that General Ross would back off and not try to involve him in the stupid abomination in this uh, fucking (laughs) Avengers initiative. It's, uh... Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I think, like, that's why, because what, I th- I think, like, like why I wanted to do this show is because Disney, one, t- to kind of outline Disney becoming this this cultural hegemonic monolith and why it's bad, but also because I'm sort of fascinated with how the MCU became this depersonalized assembly line where there's no... Yeah. Like there, there's so little artistic or creative input that isn't rubber stamped by a, a marketing team somewhere. Um, and I think how it got that way was because of these early films being kind of uneven and contradicting each other. They were like, okay, if we're going to make this work, we need to to have a cohesive, centralized consistent kind of thing and and the way they did that a brand yeah and and it and it meant creating a a production process that was highly like assembly line um and and, you know it's like they turned the process of making i mean and there's always been that tension and, and with varying degrees heading one way or the other between commercial interest and artistic interest but here it's like the artistic interest really has been kind of flattened out and i think they started doing that because of the problems with some of these early, I think, I think the phases were made up way later. Like, I think it's like George Lucas saying, Oh, you always planned a trilogy and stuff. Like they, they say, Oh yeah, you, you read the articles about this and it's all like, Oh, you know, back when Marvel was doing phase one, there, there was no phase <laughs> one. When we were an they, independent production. Yeah. But there, there was no phase one. This is all the Iron Man was a hit. Uh, John Favreau through the, the the hinting about an Avengers thing in as like fan service. And then when, when it took off the way it did, they scrambled to like, Oh, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do this whole they gambled thing. On yeah. It. Um, but it was never the plan from the beginning. It was an improvised. Right. Um, right. So, um, and actually, f- um, since you brought up, uh, to transition from the mention of assembly line, we, where do we find our hero? He is uh, currently in hiding. Um, again, we've by, we've shoved all the whole, whole, like, you know, the core of the Hulk origin story that, you know, Bruce Banner injects himself with a, um, a faulty, at, at least I believe in the comics, he's trying to recreate the super soldier serum that created Captain America. No, no. Um, in the, and that is a, is it? In the not? comics? No. I, I mean, unless, I mean, I, they, they might have retconned the comics 80 times, but like the original Hulk origin story is it's an atomic bomb. He's a nuclear scientist. Something okay. goes wrong. It's like a, it's like a white sands type test. Something goes wrong and he's out of the trench bunker thing and gets caught in the blast. That's so much more interesting. Well, that's, well, that's what I was thinking it's about like, is like, I mean, they always like, cause it is nuclear metaphor. Yeah. Cause like the radiation, like I, I get why with like Spider-Man, you're like, Oh, a radioactive spider is, that is pretty stupid. And like, we'll make it a genetic engineering thing. That, that is a sensible choice, but yeah, it's like, like to me, I was, I was, I was just, as I was watching this movie, cause the movie itself doesn't have a ton to say, but I was thinking about the character of the Hulk more broadly. And yeah. one, and I think potentially he's the most like interesting character Marvel has by far. Um, and one okay. of those, I've got a few reasons for that, but one of them is that in his original origin story, like he is kind of a walk. He's kind of like Godzilla almost. Like he's a walking nuclear yeah. bomb or nuclear bomb product. 
And it's, I thought that was kind of interesting because you can read it as like, well, okay, we, we created this horrible weapon. We have this horrible power and now we're responsible for having it without losing control of it and doing something horrible. Yeah. Um, and I think that that would be a much more, had that been sort of the direction this had gone in or like, I don't, I can't think of a Hulk again. I'm not, I'm not a Hulk head. Um, but like that, that, or like, as I said, if really Hulk leaned into more of the body horror aspects, I mean, yeah, there's of it, that would make a very interesting choice, but I, I think fans would hate it. Um, I, I, I mean, which, yeah, maybe yeah. But the Hulk, like the thing with the Hulk that's so interesting to me is he, his, his tension is he has this power that is like every like most superheroes, there's that sense of like, oh, how do I responsibly use my power? But you kind of always assume that they will. Like, like there's right. never like you never worry about Superman, except when well, I guess when they do like the red kryptonite, it's whatever. Zack Snyder Superman. Yeah, but you generally like Superman is never worrying about like what happens if I on day to day basis isn't worrying like what happens if I lose my cool if a guy really pisses me off and I and I just laser is I just melt his face with my laser eyes like. The Hulk is in this yeah. tension of like you have this incredible power Constant. that emerges when you're emotional and irrational and prone to do something impulsive and destructive, which is Hulk so much more can't interesting. Fuck. Oh yeah, that was. Hulk can't I was just fuck. thinking about it. Hulk can't fuck. So they, uh, I do like that they establish sort of the trigger. I don't. Well, again, I'm I'm coming from this as someone who a, you know, is not very interested in the Hulk lore. Um, B has not read any of the comics or any of their various iterations or, you know, the different what, what about reiterations the Lou of the Hulk backstory. TV show. But I I did like the aspect of, you know, like him keeping track of his heart rate. Like if as they say, if his heart rate goes above two hundred beats per minute, he starts to roid out. Um, which uh yeah, le- leads to that really f- fucking awkward scene where, you know, Liv Tyler is like Bruce, I want to smash. And he's like, no, 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 my beeper's going off. No, no, yeah. unless, which. She's like, I, I kind of. Denying the people what they want. I want to see Hulk. Hulk literally, smash. I want to see Hulk smash. I want to see Hulk smash. But. Um, that would have been a better. Because yeah, so <laughs> one, one thing that uh, is like a minor annoyance I have with a lot of these movies is how they, they find really contrived ways to work in like old catchphrases. And. I thought this movie, like when he says Hulk smash, is just in a really contrived moment. Yeah. It's totally out of like it seems oh, like that out was of for the character fans. for him. It was for the fans. Yeah, but it's I don't know. But like if he'd said or, Hulk or smash before alone. fucking Liv Tyler, that would have been really yeah. funny. <laughs> um, but actually, sort of to make a full circle back, the reason I said sort of your assembly line, uh. Uh, I, I think we can a, we can well, range. Because he's he's working at um uh well a know, Brazilian the, for the movie properly opens plant. he's working at a like a bottling factory that makes like green juice that is not Mountain Dew uh it is just as green um but this led for a, a mo- so he's working as like a day laborer just around I guess which could be in, like is interesting he's just trying to keep a low profile. But he accidentally cuts himself at one point. Some blood spills out um, and he freaks out because his blood is contaminated with gamma radiations. And for about five to ten minutes, I was convinced they were going to treat Hulk's blood like it was HIV AIDS. Yeah. And I, I messaged you. I was like, oh, my God. And then... To make it better, the contaminated uh, bottle of fucking whatever it was the uh, coconut green coconut juice. I don't know. I I, I just uh, it's some kind Stan of bottle. Yeah, he he drinks it and Stan dies. Stanley drinks it, and I yeah, you think I thought he was gonna get Hulk AIDS? Um, no, he just kind of like fell over or whatever, and they're like, oh, it's a case of gamma radiation. I guess we know where Bruce Banner's been hiding out. We tracked it to this little bottling factory in rio de janeiro it, it is um, also the whole yeah it is funny that they somehow like like an old man a very old man has a heart attack after drinking some crap and somehow somebody <laughs> figures out it's hulk blood and informs the army like 
Like the, the hospital, like they're just, they're shipping them to the morgue. The, the, the coroner's taking Wait, one. Wait, did he die? I got, it seemed like he did. I mean, he drops his drink I, and it I, shatters and he collapses. And that's the last that they talk about okay. his health status. Maybe he just had a heart attack, but like. <laughs> An old man having they didn't they didn't conclude that they don't specify if he's died they don't specify one or the other but like the dropping the glass shattering it kind of I don't know uh, but like but I thought it just kind of knocked him off his feet oh maybe it was a little too spicy I just the the him dropping the thing the glass and it shattering just felt like like oh that's what happens in movies when people die <laughs> yeah but um either way like so if an extremely old man has a heart attack and lives or has a heart attack and dies nobody's doing. Like like a blood test that's gonna pick up yeah. this obscure science experiment shit, and then they telling the army send in the Pentagon. Yeah, like what? they send in the Pentagon to go investigate this, and also there there is a, they make a point of showing that um, uh, the Hulk also doesn't like sexual harassment because there is a uh, very very pretty very very sweaty uh, Brazilian woman who works at the bottle factory and they kind of for a couple moments they kind of like lock eyes. It seems like they're going to be like a little bit of a meat cute. And then she's being hassled by a bunch of, uh, uh, Brazilian dude bros. Those who show up later. Those Latin American um, those men guys. are so aggressively toxically masculine. Yeah. Some, uh, putas, uh, they, they show up and, uh, they, they're like hassling her and, you know, Bruce is like, Hey, you wouldn't like me when I'm hungry. Yeah. Um, yeah, because he he doesn't speak Portuguese <laughs> very good. Well, he's learning. He's he's watching Sesame Street to learn Portuguese, which I thought was cute. Um, That's not bad. Also, Sesame Street Sesame Street is very good for you. I watched a lot of Sesame Street growing up, and I knew all my ABCs before preschool. Um, so, if you are if you happen to be a young parent listening to our podcast, a why please go attend to your child and be. Just if you'd rather be listening to this podcast and not watching your kids, just, just sit in front, of, sit in front of fucking Sesame Street. There you go. Just not Paw Patrol. Um, any anything but Paw Patrol. Not n- not those class traders. I, you know, that's that's just a long a, a long rant about a thing everybody knows sucks. Um, another the original name for this podcast. This is, what? Uh, a, it's a long rant about everything. That you already know sucks. <laughs> it was the anti pop. It was uh anti Paw Patrol podcast. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean that's the thing with this movie, and I think that's a microcosm of a lot of Marvel movies. Is you you have the bet like the best Marvel movies, and we'll we'll get to it. Are best relatively speaking are are the most frustrating because you can see them buffering up against the constraints of the formula and the brand and retreating. Um, and, yeah. and this movie is not, it's, it's, it's a more conventional commercial mentality versus uh, Edward Norton's desire to make something more yeah. of a, a, a sort of thoughtful drama. Um, but it's still like, you see like, like there's so much potential in the concept and the character to do like you do a lot with that yeah. premise. You, there, there's a lot well, of different for, ways you can frame it, yeah. and this movie kind of just it, like well, it's, like I, it meanders yeah. kind of around the whole like he wants to cure it, and then in the end, you know, we 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 like I never I just that interview you sent me like Edward Norton was like happy with like the first half of the movie, which he thought was more yeah, what he I, was aiming for, which is the better part of the movie. Oh, it's the it's definitely the more watchable and the more engaging. Um, like to sort of, and you know what? I will give this movie credit uh, for at least the first half hour. It kind of presents. It really kind of goes out of its way to show that the U.S. military are the bad guys in the situation. Like they kill dogs. Yeah. If that's not a cinematic no no, I don't know what is. And I mean, his like they kill they kill Bruce Banner's cute dog. Which is just so fucking evil. Um, and they also make a point of um, Ross, like, he's he's talking to Tim Roth's character. Tim Roth's character is like, why are we going after this guy? What What's the deal? And General Ross, um, William Hurt, uh, describes Bruce Banner as uh, someone who, quote unquote, stole military secrets. So, you know, putting him in this position of a whistleblower. So for a minute, you know, I, I thought, oh, are we going to go in this very interesting sort of like 
direction of like kind of a spy thriller or I, even sort of aping on a real world sort of event. But no, it, it this is ends before up, you know, Snowden a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was it was before Snowden, but even then, like of course, whistleblowers and shit. Yeah, that's that's um, always been a thing. Who, Pentagon. That's papers. always been a thing, and that would have been a very tangible sort of thing because that you know say what you will about and we we have said plenty already about iron man like the politics of it are atrocious but at least it has that sort of um you know tangible like angle to it it's well about the weapons industry yeah it's the first iron man was sort of like to me it was like it was well meaning but it's trapped within like that the limited imagination of an American liberal where it's like, you can never take that final yeah. step to like yeah. this, this whole thing is bad and broken. It's just, well, this the, the war is bad, but the troops are like, the, you can't yeah. ever articulate a workable critique because you can't step outside the core, like I guess, and assumption of American liberalism, which is, which is another thing I was thinking about like this movie and superheroes in general, like why, why they're so huge. And, and I got me thinking, I, like, like popularity or yeah, like physical and- wise, because uh, Hulk is like nine feet tall in here, but he's he's shaped like fucking Jonathan Joestar. I feel like the Hulk should be bigger. Not to say, well, Jonathan Joestar is a very big boy, but he, yeah, Hulk, yeah, all, all Hulk the Joestar. I feel like he could have been bigger. <laughs> I always forget watching those that like the whatever Joestar character you're following is supposed to be like 15 years old in most of them because because they're 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 all just- yeah colossal like like they they, they look well, up, like up until like Arnold halfway through part four Iraqi starts drawing people a little bit more anatomically or sizically correct well yeah you, except Koichi he constantly ca- oh, draws Koichi. Koichi like three feet yeah, he's tiny. <laughs> um you think- yeah yeah jo- Josuke is a little more of a a, a little more twink ish, not a twink, but a little yeah. more in that direction than. Like. No, I, I literally in my notes, I'm looking at it right now. I literally wrote uh, about because for the, the Hulk's first on screen appearance is after the um, you know, General Ross and um, uh, Tim Roth are like chasing after the after him through like the bottle factory in Rio de Janeiro where. Oh, look, it's the uh, sexually harassing uh, Brazilian guys. They're back again. Um, they have Bruce Banner cornered in a section of the factory, and then yeah, they're just they're know, just doing like high school in, bully stuff. But <laughs> yeah, but I I literally wrote um, well after the Hulk says leave me alone like a fucking thirteen year old emo kid. He's got the haircut too, but I I literally wrote <laughs> uh, Hulk is this like the size of Jonathan Joestar, basically. <laughs> well, I I was thinking the about the wide boy. I was going to say like Tim Roth, Tim Roth's motivations in this, such as they are, are very shonen villain motivation. Like he's just he 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 lost a fight. He just wants to beat him. Yeah, he he yeah. lost. He, he he got owned in a fight against a giant green man, and so <laughs> he, he wants to become so a giant green man so he can beat him in a fight and be the best at fighting. Like that's. <laughs> that, 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 that is fucking a, that is okay, such a classic that, like Dragon Ball Z yeah. villain kind of motivation. But I mean, I we're kind of skipping ahead here, but I do want to point out that that fucking part during that uh the this the you know Culver University, you know, fight battle sequence scene where fucking Hulk Picks up Tim Roth and throws him against a tree. No, like he a kicks him. Rag doll. He, he drop kicks him. He drop. Well, or not drop, a drop he kick. He just kicks him. Yeah. I paused. I paused like the movie and just had to stop for like two minutes because I was laughing so there's, hard. There's a few. I mean, the CGI <laughs> in this so movie funny. isn't great, but there's a few. Uh, something about like the snappiness of the editing and the way they do it. Like, there's a few times guys get thrown around in this movie. And it is it's oh, goes it's, yeet. it's funny, but it's like there's it like like when Tim Roth slams into that tree, it like it actually it's looks like so it would funny. hurt. And he like he's he all smashed crumpled. every bone like, in his body. Like but, but I mean there's there's a, a sense of impact and inertia and like, oh, that would actually hurt that is usually missing from so much of this stuff that appears yeah, a little a, bit in this movie. Uh in, in, that, in bits that counts and pieces. as that's that's part of what I like to count as a and out oop moment. Uh because that that did look like yeah. 
Tim Roth getting yeeted into that tree really looks like it. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> and and the guy <laughs> when he, he he hulks out, he throws the guy bullying um like through like the industrial office part of the factory, and he slams on the wall. That also looked. Um, not like convincing, but like for oh, aesthetically, like super CG. super CG. But like the way it's done had like that sense of like, oh, that would really fucking hurt. Um, and yeah. I think like that first Hulk appearance is like like the special effects weaknesses notwithstanding, kind of solid because they do it a little bit like a horror movie, like al- like a horror action movie, like Aliens uh, or something. He's kind of in the shadows, very foggy. taking guys out, and I thought that. Like treating him a little bit like a horror movie, like he's he is kind of Frankenstein, right? It's he's tech. I mean, you so you this was pre the Disney acquisition, yeah. So Universal is the uh ones who just dis- the studio that distributed this, and I believe Universal might still have yeah. the rights to distributing Hulk movies, which is the reason why there hasn't been a standalone Hulk yeah, movie Yeah, he just shows this. up in other movies because Disney doesn't want to give Universal a cut of any of that stuff. Yeah, so but you could you could make the argument that Hulk is a universal monster. He he you is could, kind of like he fits, technically speaking. He fits that mold of like, you know, like kind of tragic and like you could do it's a it's a dr jekyll and mr hyde yeah yeah situation that's hulk is literally dr jekyll and mr hyde yeah and and that's why actually that's why like in like league of story gentlemen like their their mr hyde is just the hulk basically <laughs> oh yeah so i like listened, he is like because um, i think in yeah. the original story he's just it just makes him a psycho but he doesn't like turn huge or anything <laughs> Doesn't I don't think so. Doesn't he like rape the invisible man? In the comics, you, yes. In, or something in the comics. In the comics, yes. In the, yeah. the movie is like a very like oh, I, 90s yeah. style, really goofy blockbuster. Um the yeah, comics are Alan. The comics it. are Alan Moore. And yeah, in the second volume, yeah. the invisible man does something to Mina Harker, who's not a vampire, she's just Mina Harker. Um and abuses her or does something to her and and uh doc and and dr jekyll is like in love with her so he rapes and he doesn't just rape the invisible man he rapes him to death it, that it Jesus fucking rules Christ. the, the leaf story gentlemen that, like the actual comic so is awesome hardcore. it's insane that's so <laughs> hardcore, and, and i i am morbidly fascinated i i read those that, but... <laughs> i i downloaded them and read them on like a crt monitor computer in in the late two thousands, I should go back to those and and reread them. Um, but yeah, that that was a standout moment yeah. of of really going there. And the Invisible Man is he's not in the in the Leonardo Gentleman movie. He's just like a, a chipper Cockney guy who happened to find the original Invisible Man's formula. In in the comics, yeah, they didn't get the rights to it. No, it's H. G. Wells. It's like no one owns the rights to it. They just didn't want him because the, the, oh, at least in the movie they didn't get the rights to like the Invisible Man as the oh someone like, might own a movie monster a brand thing. oh maybe but in the in the original H.G. Wells novel and all that stuff's like out of copyright um he is a psychopath it's closer to like the Paul Verhoeven Follow Man uh, Hollow Man than anything else um okay and in the comics he is a psychopath he just like casually murders people to amuse himself um okay. throughout um okay I will have to. I would I would check I I haven't read that. them since I was a teenager but you know it's Alan Moore it'll be interesting um yeah. if nothing else um um but let's you know what you who we haven't talked about yet we've we need to talk about Edward Norton cuz oh boy he is not Bruce Banner and if never has a movie made me want to see uh Mark Ruffalo so badly he is um, I I didn't have a hu- any problems with him in this movie but like Mark Ruffalo brings he's so much better. He, he's so much he, better. He he brings like a certain um like like he 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 brings the like war like like cuz Bruce Banner in contrast with the Hulk's anger is supposed to be like a really good guy generally and he brings a lot of kind of like warmth to him. Like, yeah. Like you there's, there's like, like you need like just, you, you need yeah. that contrast whereas, whereas Ed Norton's a bit more like cold and focused kind of brooding I think that's guy. A, that's the way to describe it. Um and, and not to say Mark Ruffalo hasn't had his share of intense roles like, you know, Zodiac, um uh he plays a really horny cop in in the cut um who he he fucking eats Meg Ryan's pussy in that movie. Oh hell yeah. That, hell is, yeah. is that why it's called in the cut? Yeah, well, you, and you also kind of see his cock for like a flash of a second. It's not like a full like cock shot, but it's enough that it, it 
got included on my uh yup that's a dick letter box list is he but, uh is he packing um, how's he i it it wasn't it it was like it like it was again it wasn't the whole dick but it it was a dick it was a dick i'll just leave it there um but like mark ruffalo at least seems just he just works better for me. He has like more of that. Just Edward Norton's just missing something. He's like he's um, like, like he said, he's, be- he's a little too cold and intense. Yeah, and I think to contrast with he, the Hulk, you want a Bruce Banner who's got like a like a like a human warmth to he, him. But he's more a, a, Mark Ruffalo has more of like an affability affability there that's a good way to put it yeah the way i describe it um like he's also edward norton like i feel like mark ruffalo is a little wider kind of i don't i don't yeah edward Edward norton someone as skinny and narrow as edward norton in this yeah like the hulk's face looks the the face they give the hulk i think the cgi is not great the face isn't good it's it is too weird and wide but what they tried to do with the way he moves and like giving him veins and, and texture, I like I appreciate what they were trying to do with him because that Ang Lee Hulk, I remember, he looks rubbery. He's all CG, yeah. but he, he looks rubbery and, and smooth. He kind of lacks texture when he gets. Sh- I remember vividly when I watched this movie at like age thirteen, fourteen, the Ang Lee Hulk. When the army's like shooting at him, it's like his skin responds like taut rubber with the bullets bouncing off like with little dimples yeah. and that always seemed like weird to me it looked really weird um and and didn't feel right so like they 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 they, they tried what they were like this is a lot of movie where it's like you like up until like the last act it's like it, it doesn't work but like i appreciate what they were trying to do with it like they were trying to make a real movie um at yeah least. um I'm just I'm looking at pictures of the uh, Eric Bana, right? And it's it's yeah. I I can't give you a definitive answer as to whether Edward Norton Hulk or Eric Bana Hulk looks better because they both look uh, bad. No, yeah, no, no, none of them really look good. Um, I, I, I mean, even even like even Mark Ruffalo Banner is kind of a little disconcerting because it's just, it's kind of his face melded into this giant green guy. Yeah, well, that's... And that that kind of has a, you know, like a curve. You gotta, like, a, there's like an uncanny valiness a little bit to it's, it. It's just that CGI is not great for the... And I mean, this is why, like, the big CGI fight at the end still doesn't work is, is that... You're watching you're watching a movie that's mostly live action with actors and everything else, and then two cartoons start wrestling and it doesn't yeah. <laughs> fit right. Now there's and it's not like I'm anti CGI, but there's a lot better and worse ways to deploy it and blend it with other things. And I think I was thinking like, how would I do because it's a challenge, right? How do you make that? Because you can't just like paint Lou Ferrigno green. That looks pretty ridiculous. Um, that, when you're yeah. making a TV show in the seventies, that's the best you can do. But I started thinking like, do you remember the giants in game of Thrones and the wolves where they just took like an actual guy and just like made them bigger, but there's still like an actual guy. Yeah. Like yeah. if you took an actual guy, put him in some prosthetics, but then like use CGI to make them bigger and then, and, and, and then just like, like tweak, like, like like tweak this like smooth out the seams on the practical uh, side. I think that maybe would work better than going all CGI. Although the other alternative is what I think like most superhero movies should do, which is just be cartoons, just be animated. But just be big big budget Saturday morning cartoons is I feel like the ideal or what a lot of at the time. I think Marvel really wanted to go for, um, yeah. Again, like playing up, playing into that nostalgia angle is huge. Like you know, eighties kids cannot let their media die. Like it's the reason we have another fucking Ghostbusters out. It's the reason you know all like all these reboots of old franchises are constantly being made. Like nothing new is happening. It's because nostalgia has such a grip on our current um, movie and media landscape. You, you know what? Actually, um, it's just, you know, 
Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. I just, I was just made me think. I, I reread. Speaking of Alan Moore, speaking of superheroes, I reread Watchmen, um, a little while ago, and there is a whole bit with, uh, with Ozzy Mattias, with with Adrian Veidt, because he's got his whole marketing empire, and he's doing this thing. He sits in front of eight hundred TVs at once and does his mega brain analyze the world, um, tap into the irrational sort of deal, and, and he's like, well, okay, you know, there's. Well, we'll make all of our marketing about nostalgia and fond memories and and because it's a time of crisis and war is looming and that's what people turn to. And he's like, you see ads in the background for nostalgia, the perfume by Vite and stuff. And then at the yeah. end of the story, when war is averted, he rebrands everything to be a millennium and like new vision of the future type stuff. And that felt really on point. And I think like, like, like the, the, the constant, because the nostalgia thing starts in the seventies, happy days um, yeah. is a fifties throwback. Um, American graffiti, get Back to the Future, like Back to the Future Two, anticipated in nineteen eighty nine that in twenty fifteen we'd be in the midst of eighties nostalgia, the same way they were doing fifties and going into sixties nostalgia at that point. Um, and I think. The the I mean nostalgia is always a thing. There's always throwbacks and revivals to an extent. And I mean that's in some ways it's it's good. You go back to the past, you find evolutionary dead ends or things that have been kind of unused, and you pick them up and iterate on them. But like like total atavistic escapism um, is something for a society in crisis, and and we've been in perpetual crisis since the mid 1970s. And it's only intensified. Yeah. So that's why we're in these compounding echo boom overlapping, catching up with each other waves of nostalgia, I think. Um, and, and why we just yeah. can't let well, I mean, also the thing is just the the I think declining rates of profit lead and and consolidation lead to these giant, huge, monopolistic but brittle corporations to be very, very, very conservative with their decision-making, which also means just exploiting anything with existing recognition. So that's another yeah. um, more direct. Or out the IPs, baby. Yeah. Um, can we go back to um, – because we we still got – we're not done with Edward Norton yet. No, no, his, yeah, by, by all means, his, sorry. I just his – role, His role went beyond um, just being the star of it. He also uh, – wrote a lot of the screenplay um so just because i am not literate enough at seven o'clock at night eastern to you know eloquently summarize sort of what went down uh behind the scenes of this movie i'm just gonna read from um an article from collider uh from their series how the mcu was made um the incredible hulk's dueling visions and dueling cuts uh this is by Adam Chitwood, um, and he gives a pretty good, uh, or at least readable rundown of sort of the mess that went on behind the scenes with this movie. Um, so the, let me just read from here. The, uh, 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 Zach Penn, who wrote, uh, X-Men Last Stand, uh, by noted pedophile, Director, wait, was that Brian Singer? Was no, no. no last Singer. stand was Brett Ratner, who was a sex pest of adult women instead oh, of uh, okay. teenage boys. Well, completely different. Brett, Brett, uh, rush so hours. Writer, Brett Ratner. <laughs> so uh, Zach Penn was the first screenwriter on board and wrote multiple drafts, ultimately earning sole screenplay credit for the film. However, the film is really where things start to get interesting in early two thousand seven. Penn left the project to attend to his film, The Grand. I've uh, never heard of that. No, me neither. Uh, at, at which point, casting for the role of Bruce Banner was underway. Latir, um, I'm not pronouncing the director's last name right, but I don't really care. Uh, the director initially wanted to cast Mark Ruffalo, and he would have been right. Um, but Marvel instead lobbied for Edward Norton because he was, quote unquote, more famous, and according to the was director. Was Edward Norton really a name by 2008? Like that? American History X. That was that, American Fight History Club. X was Fight Club. 1999. By, by, 2007, by 2007, Fight Club was huge. But, but like, both you, those. You were in Fight Club. 
But both those movies are 2009. What big roles did Edward Norton have? Uh, Or 1999, I meant to say. Like, that's that's the end of the 90s. This is almost a decade later. What did Edward Norton... Like, what big, big tentpole movies had Edward Norton... Um, done. At he that dated point. Courtney Love for a while. Oh, that's that's, that's dark. Think of um, that's but that's, uh, so what, that's weird to think about, man. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, negotiations with Norton began with an unfinished screenplay that Penn had left behind uh, when Norton saw as which Norton saw as an opportunity to help craft the story, according to the director. Um, he is quoted as saying they knew they wanted to revive Hulk and they wanted to use animation. Uh, the rest was for me to figure out. So starting with Zach Penn, we crafted a story, made it hours, finding different ideas from comic books and trying to compile them in one big story. And then Zach had to do his movie. So we left and Edward, who we were seeing as an actor, said, I write screenplays. So I asked if he could do the last draft and he said, no problem. Um, For note, the only credited, the only movie that uh, Edward Norton is credited as a writer for is a movie called Motherless Brooklyn, and that came out in 2019. Ads. So I remember uh, ads for that. Is that, I feel, if I'm remembering right, not a lot of people had anything good to say about it? I I wonder if this is like a John Turturro thing where like Turturro keeps writing and directing his own dramas and nobody likes them. Or something like that. Um, but uh, just continuing from the Collider Sorry, article. Sorry, yeah. Um, Norton's screenplay contributions remain a matter of debate as the Writers Guild of America sided with Penn in arbitration, hence his sole credit. And Penn subsequently expressed his displeasure at Norton, attesting that he himself wrote the script. But actors on set noted that Norton was writing during filming as the film continued to evolve while Latier... Uh, the director and Norton reportedly fought to make the film more cerebral while Marvel fought to make the film more commercial. Um, and I believe Edward, I'm not sure who this quote is attributed to, uh, it might be either the director or Norton, but someone said a movie is a sum of compromises until you go into your own independence. They always try to bring the character and the actor forward. Okay. I presume this is the director. It's very obvious in The Incredible Hulk. The first half of the movie is really mine, and the second half of the studio's expected Hulk movie. Two giants kicking each other's ass. Um, And that's... So there was... They shot, actually, and this was a um, Edward Norton contribution. The original very opening scene is supposed to show Bruce Banner um, going to, like, the recesses of, like, fucking Antarctica, I believe, is shot in, like, British Columbia. It's Oh, it's absolutely it British Columbia, yeah, um, as, as someone who in, lives in your there. Homeland, in your homeland. Um, but it shows Bruce Banner literally tries to kill himself. <laughs> the, the hero of our story, this movie was originally going to open with a suicide attempt, which I'm all fucking for. Me too. For. Yeah, no. That is super interesting. Um, That's a great opening. I... But I watched the opening sequence and I don't think they they either – I don't think they finished with the CG because the CG looks really bad. Well, I mean the CG Uh, doesn't look great through the whole movie. So that is probably – Yeah, but this this one, I don't know if it was just the low resolution of the clip on YouTube. But the CG like, uh, you know, Hulk opens his hand and it's a very poorly CGI rendered gun in his hand. But I – you know, if if this movie had opened – with Bruce Banner, like, trying to kill himself. If that had been, like, an overarching, like, theme or, like, thing for him. Like, if, if Bruce Banner was constantly trying to fucking kill himself throughout this movie or come up with, like, inventive ways to try to kill himself, that would have no, been That so would have been, cool. like, because I was thinking, like, the like the chase sequence that opens the movie. Like I said, like, the first 30 minutes, I was pretty engaged. Um and I was thinking, like, what's interesting about the chase sequence, what the guy's beating him up, is it's not that he's in danger. It's that he's trying not to be a danger to all the people pursuing him and everything around him, and which yeah. is an interesting tension. Um, Especially because in that context, it's the U.S. Army. It's the fucking, uh, you know, operatives who are causing way much more of a danger and posing yeah. way much more of a danger to the, you know, people of Rio de Janeiro. Like, you know, Edward Norton runs through like this crowd of children at one point, And then, you know, the fucking Tim Roth and all, you know, the fucking green berets or fucking whatever 
they run through and, you know, everyone scrambles. G- guys and who've definitely, it, it, like, it murdered kind of, children. Yeah, it, it kind of, I don't want to say that it kind of, like, disturbed me a little, just because, uh, like, I feel like, you know, Rio de Janeiro is very infamous for, um, you know, having a lot of, you know, crimes uh, that go on, like having a very corrupt police force, um, just, but, like, and, of course, just American intervention in the global South has created these situations in the first place, but just sort of, like, it just, it I don't know. Um, it, at least the sequence was, like, engaging. It had, you know, a pace. It had a real stake to it because, again, he's he's not running so much from um you know the government he's running in order not to pose a danger to other people yeah and I, which is a very nice angle and i was thinking like the later parts of the like like through the later parts of the movie where it kind of slows down i think too much is Ugh. what what would make a hulk movie interesting is you always need to be kind of hulk edging you constantly need to be hulk edging <laughs> yeah you need to be hulk edging you constantly need to be there, there needs to be always that underlying menace that that at any given moment this guy could flip out and do something wildly destructive. Like they they do establish he's got a he's got a body count. Like a few people have died from him flipping out and going Hulk mode. Yeah. Um, and that like you, all the you time you wouldn't like me when I'm horny. <laughs> yeah, and all, like so all the time he's been with, with Tyler. All the time he's trying to sneak around places. Like there should always be that. That tension should never entirely go away. Of like, this guy is a walking t- a walking bomb. Um, yeah, and so you can go a long time without having an actual Hulk sequence to pay that off if you can sustain that tension. But that, th- but the whole middle not. section, the tension disappears. He's just a guy yeah. reconnecting with his 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 uh, his his ex girlfriend. Um, yeah, can we can we talk about Liv Tyler for a second because. Oh boy, is she just kind of sleepwalking through this? There's um, there's one moment where she where she gets really mad at a cabbie when they do like a yeah, New the, York is so crazy joke. She, that is the all the emotion. But she she should, all the emotion just at once, and that's the like because just the 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 most emotion she has displayed throughout this old. I, like, I feel like so emotion. so many movies, she's just kind of there to be pretty and is kind of pretty, passive yeah and in, and she, for this one like 10 second sequence i was like i enjoy watching Liv tyler get mad at a guy she she came alive for a second the way she doesn't in a lot of movies for me and i was just like why don't we get more of that with her that was great yeah no like um who does she who does it's, she play in lord of the rings arwen and she is kind of just uh, nothing in those movies from what from what I remember, but doesn't, and it's doesn't not really. Arwen have like that one sort of part where she kind of goes like demonic or something. No, that's like, Galadriel. Okay, see, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a Lord of the Rings head, so I'm not a. Token I haven't, head. Uh, re- uh, I haven't reread the books or watched those movies in years, so it's kind of. Uh, who played Galadriel? It was. Um, I know this. Uh, was it Kate Blanchett? Yes, Kate Blanchett. I mean, See, I think there's one there's or no actress. I think there's one or two moments in those movies where she kind of gets to monologue a bit. That's a bit more interesting. But but I mean, the movies don't give her a lot to do. She's just kind of be like she's she's more of yeah, she's more of Liv, a figure than a character for a lot of that. Yeah, um, Liv Tyler has always struck me as not so much an actor, but just a very pretty person who just happens to be in movies. Yeah, you know, I mean, your dad's um, famous and she's she's good. Yeah, um, I mean, but like that nepotism, that moment with her yelling at the cabbie, I was just like. Oh, I enjoyed that a lot. I liked seeing her be a little like like angry and like sort of awkwardly feisty. And that was a light that was a light moment in a movie where the re- everything else feels very dour. Um like that that moment in particular that felt like something out of like Iron Man. Like a very Yeah, and, and I mean like not it's not quite improvised it's but like totally off the cuff. Yeah, it's it's totally weird yeah. like the movie gets very good like you can see it like shift gears into like what would become the mcu house style a bit where it's like the the movie looks brighter the scientist guy they go to meet is this total goofball they do this wacky new york mr. jokes blue. yeah um mr blue like the whole tone shifts into kind of generic marvel mode but just as as an actress i was like it was just this flash of like Liv tyler actually having this energy where i was just like why in all these movies she's been in I think the only other time she's ever really stood out to me was Empire Records, where she. I haven't. That's a movie I should have seen a long time ago, and I have not. It's seen. Uh, that is um, a, a strange, 
a strange film, but it's it's a it's a fun watch from what I, I remember finding it charming when I was a teenager, which was like twelve years after it came out. It's a very it's a very Gen X movie. I I like Gen yeah. well, except Re- Reality Bites fucking sucks. Um, Never seen I it. I love you, Winona Ryder, but uh, I mean I haven't watched that movie in a long time. But I just the message of it really blows. Um, sort of going Tim Roth though I quite enjoy I I, like, I always like Tim Roth, Roth is, is good in everything under I think. underwritten underused in this under movie. underwritten a little bit but like he he has things to do unlike uh Betty Ross yeah, Betty Ross who's... really doesn't get anything to do which is the reason I and again I'm I'm actually really ex- looking forward to rewatching the first Captain America because I do really love his angle with like Peggy Carter because that's a female character who is you know a love interest but she actually has shit to do she has and she serves a purpose and she has like a personality that you know goes beyond being like the love interest yeah. whereas you know she's she's just like I'm the love interest so I do, do you... science for a second I thought she was supposed to be Mr. Blue. I I didn't remember and the that movie that well so and I cool. thought I thought would have been great if she's just been like quietly working with him the Helping. whole time to cure, like that I yes, I kind of thought they would so do that cool. I would have been great. and then you 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 dispense with an extraneous character it ties everything together way better you get more tension between her and her dad which is another I think underutilized and it makes me wonder, like I'm curious what the full Edward Norton version of the movie would have been because it could have been a more compelling yeah. drama, or it could have been like, like, like a you know, like those kind a of mess. yeah, like like something where it's like it's it's trying to do all these things and failing because it's a bit sooty yeah, and and, and grasping. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I'm curious though. I, I I'm kind of curious to see what that would have looked like, but um, we'll never know. Uh, one thing I was kind of interested in. Is so so he shows up and there's no like she's not afraid of him. There's none of that. Oh, you and I thought I was kind of wondering like, is it good? Because I hate stories that contrive melodrama by just giving characters zero benefit of the doubt to each other, and that always kind of drives yeah. me insane. Um, but then at the same time, it's like the last time she saw this guy, he turned into a green giant and put her in the hospital. And hit her. <laughs> Um, yeah. is she going to be just like, oh, hey, you're, you're, you're back. It's great. I always loved you. Or is she going to be scared? Like, like it's, it's I, she weird that she has, pizzeria. she's like not scared at him. She's not scared of him at all. Um, yeah, at any point in this for, movie. Like this, it, it, several times they're like, just blatantly trying to rip off like King Kong. Like, oh like yeah, King totally. Kong. Or, like, I wrote or down Beauty and the Beast. King Kong and Tarzan. Like the, the scene where they're, you know, in that fucking cave. And that that was the point where I was just like, this this is really starting to suck. Yeah. Um Yeah, that was again, weird. She just like he's in Hulk mode. No chemistry. And she she like no sleeps chemistry. with him and wakes and it's not till he hasn't turned into everyone. And I'm like, that's a, like and it, crazy to just fall asleep oh, next to this also, giant dude. There was a weird edit there too, because she wakes up and Bruce Ban- Bruce Banner is sleeping next to her immediately cuts to her like walking out of a motel and he and he's like on the other side of the parking lot or something just like that well that with his toes corn like and i guess it's supposed to be like oh some time has passed like they've gotten into a that that is that is a late out and that that is but a I late like, cutting of the earlier version of the movie where they've just oh that, that has to be because it's, it's just such an ab- abrupt cut because there's another it, one later yeah. where they capture Ed Norton and they're they're taking him away and 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 Liv Tyler has a fight with with her dad William Hurt and is like I I'm not your daughter anymore you're, you're I will you're, never address you as yeah father and, ever and he's again. like, like I'm the only reason you're not being wrestling. and she storms off down the street and then hard cut her and Edward Norton are together in the helicopter with William Hurt yeah and that was Ooh. really like why is she gone Who's from being nervous? sent away to being on this, and it's be, I think it's just like late reshoots, heavy cutting, trying to make it. This has more of a blockbuster. Editors. Oh, yeah. This has three editors: uh, John Wright, Rick Shane, and Vincent Tab Tabalian. Um, Vincent uh, Tabalian. Vincent has worked a bunch with this director. Uh, I'm on the Wikipedia page, and Rick Shane does not have his own Wikipedia page, and. John Wright has edited for 
Um, <laughs> okay, well, he was the editor for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. Um, and uh, You don't want to know the secret of the And X-Men and Passion of the Christ. To, Passion uh, of the Christ. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, Christ Passion is the, the Christ. original superhero. Uh, yeah, Jesus was... Jesus was the original MCU hero. Um, yeah, this when you got too many fucking cooks in the kitchen, it's always, at least to me, it's always like a warning sign when you see like five plus people show up in like the screenplay. That's or, like, oh, that's written, always a bad sign. Or yeah. more than more than two editors, that's always a bad sign. Yeah. And- like I distinctly remember seeing like. Five screenwriters for Jurassic World, and that was when when I saw that in the theater. That's when my that's a real I'm like, cobbled Uh-oh. together mess. <laughs> uh oh. We should actually, you know what? We should watch those as part of like no, franchi- no. You know, actually, you know, I, Jurassic no. Jurassic World Two is hysterical. That's like Amazing Spider Man. Okay, too. I might I um, might want to see. I might because Jurassic I will never World watch Two Jurassic World again though. Jurassic World Two that made me angry. halfway through it becomes Resident Evil. Okay. It becomes yeah, to my. I've is, seen the half of the is, bag about there it. There is a mansion, and and this blew me away because it's so it's so direct. There is a mansion, a, 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 a an architecturally absurd mansion, and there is a secret lab under the mansion where they're making genetically engineered bioweapons. They happen Dinosaur to they happen mansion. to be dinosaurs, but like that's that is the original Resident Evil game. <laughs> it's like it's like ridiculous. Epstein's Island, but instead of child porn, it's dinosaurs. You know, if they if they if they ever do like clone dinosaurs, some rich guy's gonna buy one and fuck it. I mean, that's Jeffrey Epstein presumably was like close to doing that. He wanted like to make hybrid humans or some shit. He, Whatever. That, um, he did, all the stuff about him like isn't like spooky to me. It's just like, oh yeah, he's he's just a suit. He's just a, a fucking big stupid nerd and because he's got all this money and is surrounded by sycophants he he's bought into his own delusions of genius but it's all just crank stuff like rich rich people Damn, just have a lot of are we, are stupid we talking crank about beliefs. jeffrey epstein or tony stark right now uh, um anyways i, I mean I, you I know also, what tony stark was on the flight logs he was definitely on the he flight was absolutely logs. on um, the fucking flight logs he's, he's um, flying out to little saint james in the suit <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Wait, you said oh, Edward no. Norton. You said Edward Norton dated Courtney Love. I forgot he was in that People versus was, Larry Flint. So that must be where they I, met. I, I and she was in Courtney Love in his but black she was book. On the flight logs. She's not in the flight logs. She was, she was in his black logs. book, but with like five numbers, like circled. Um, yeah, I can't ignore that. Um, hold on, let me let me just let me let me pick some gems also from my notes. Um, Oh, I wrote that Hulk also has by Shonen eyes. There, there are several shots. Oh of yeah, he, do- he does. Edward yeah, Norton Hulk, where his eyes look very anime. Because they're they're reason. trying they're to just very very shiny. They're trying to make dewy. him a moat. It's just, like like they tr- like they're trying to make him moe. Yeah, Hulk is moe through helplessness. You know, I w- I was thinking as you mentioned, we've mentioned JoJo's Bizarre Adventure a couple times now, and, and I've been thinking. Times. Um, because it is kind of, it's, I mean, it's it's a shonen first and foremost, but like, it does kind of have that superhero element because all the stands have like really unique, weird powers. Yeah. And I was thinking like, what what makes fights and JoJo's really good uh, when they're really good is- Because they're stupid it, well, it's, and, com- and complicated. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not just- it's, it's so stressful. They're, but they're set up like puzzles. Like you've got these powers do X, Y, and Z, and this stand- does A, B, C, and has these limitations, and it's like a, yeah. it's like, it's like every fight is like a puzzle. You figure out how the enemy stand works, then you figure out how you can exploit it with your stand, and that's interesting. Every every time when it when it when it goes well, it's it's a really it's a really interesting formula for a superpower fight versus like I'm really strong and fly. You're really strong and fly. We hit each other really hard and throw each other into buildings. It's like a, a good superhero on superhero fight. If you, if you're going to have them, I think has to be an asymmetric matchup of, a, of, of interesting abilities and, and a kind of contest to cleverly exploit each other's abilities to win. That's, that's to me is when yeah. a superpower fight can be interesting. Um, and it's, yeah, and unfortunately the, f- the the climactic fight in this movie is not not even remotely. Movies. It's it's dull as oh dishwater. Um, it's 
For, well, first of all, uh, uh, Abomination looks like a fucking Resident Evil monster. No, you um, take that back. Resident Evil has some great <laughs> monster designs. That is that is completely a unfair. A bad Resident Evil. Excuse me, a bad Resident Evil. Okay, but he's like, yeah, he looks like sure. something like Resident Evil 5, sure. Um, like, uh, yeah, it lo- looks it looks like a fucking PS3 fight. Um, it, yeah. It's, it's bad. Although, although the Hulk does smash a couple of NYPD. Cars and wear him his boxing with, gloves, which was and wear his box, that's boxing out of a, gloves. Which, that's out of a video game. It is. There was is that, and like, on the, PS a Hulk video game on PS2. There was a game called Hulk Ultimate Destruction, which I think was made by like Pandemic, <laughs> like the guys that did Mercenaries, okay. which was all like it's like open world and like all the buildings are destructible kind of thing. And it's it's all about like yeah, like so many of the props and environments in the game can be smashed up, and you can pick up stuff and throw it and, and use it in various ways. And that was one of the things you could do, I swear, was like you could rip a car in half or, or something like that and use them as like boxing gloves. It was like one of the abilities you can unlock. That's um, fun. That's that, it was fun. actually, you know what? A solid a solid game. Solid late PS2 era open world beat 'em up game. I had a lot of fun with it as a kid. That's that's fun. Um this this fight is not fun. It is very boring. It's very boring. Um it is very boring. It's, it's textbook uh, boring superhero movie. It's, yeah, fight. it's it's like the movie can't wait to kind of finish. I guess it just although they're the sort of Un- unlike unlike Edward is, Norton, who's always edging. Yeah, and again, Hulk Hulk constantly has to edge because you know if he gets too horny, he'll Hulk out. Which got me thinking. Well, like, that, that's what Mark Ruffalo because, says in Avengers. He's he's mastered edging, and he says to to, to yeah. He says to Captain America, um, "I'm always horny." I am always horny, um, which because obviously in the you know future MCU movies, Hulk gets paired off with Black Widow, and sort of the the big stupid reveal in uh, the second Avengers movie is uh, Black Widow is like. I cannot have children. I was made oh, sterile. Oh, God, that was so, so stupid. Oh, I it, forgot about so that. It's so insulting. But you know what? Now, knowing that Hulk literally can't fuck or he'll, you know, roid out, well, kind of I mean, makes... Maybe he you know, can they're, they're by then. the perfect celibate couple. She can't have children. He can't fuck. There we go. Well, no, if I mean, that's like the ideal situation, right? Like, no, no accidents. No making little Hulk babies. No. Oh, my God. That oh, God, I forgot about that. That was that was so like I was like, really, this character is the person who's torn up about not being able to get pregnant. Like a lot of people just choose that on purpose. Like it's not that big. It, I could see it like for certain for a character if you establish beforehand, like that they really want to have a family or something. Sh- sure, like that could be perfectly legitimately dramatic and sad. But th- like that character out of nowhere to just be like, well. The thing that's really tearing her up inside is she can't have children. Like, when did she ever have she a family that she wanted out. to emulate in the first place? Like, what the hell? Exactly. Well, that's well. We don't have to worry about that until we. Yeah, we got a, a few more. Avengers. Yeah, so that's we got. We got a, a few movies. Go. We got a few movies to go. Um, um, uh, anything else we want to talk about the movie itself? Um, I mean, Mister Blue is played by the guy who's Buster Scruggs. Oh, I uh, actually haven't, I haven't seen. Buster I haven't seen Scruggs. that movie. I, sh- I haven't seen that movie, but I, I instantly, I was like, "That looks he's, like the Buster Scruggs guy," and it is. He he seems um, like he's. I have nothing against him as an actor. He's probably he's doing. I'm pretty sure he's just doing exactly what he's been told to. But in this movie, I found him too goofy and annoying for the movie. He, I was confused about like why he started helping. Tim Roth's character. He, was he just like so far gone? Because they're, like his, they're trying to do so something he's, he's like just, yeah. him and Tim he's, Roth are both like in awe of the Hulk power and want to harness it somehow. But it's just it's underdeveloped as a motivation. Yeah, that's the problem. Power because yeah, they make a point of showing that. Um, yeah, they like uh, set up Mr. Blue they, is like synthesizing Hulk's blood, which uh, Bruce Banner is like destroy this immediately. It's no, don't don't do this at all. Um, but I guess at the and I didn't quite catch this. I had to reread a synopsis of the movie. Um, so after Mr. Blue or I don't even remember the, the actual guy's name after he like further injects uh, Tim Roth's character with some shit to help turn him into the abomination. He is also contaminated with Hulk blood and 
So he starts like. Well, no, he he took and it they, they throwing it to something gross. The, uh, Tim Roth and it's takes just nev- it's just a, never a super about again. Uh, t- Tim Roth takes a superhero serum that they're hinting at was like an attempt to, br- to an attempt to do what made Captain America. Yeah, and then yeah. he he takes. Uh, Pardon. He takes um. It's okay. Hulk blood. He takes Hulk blood to um try and get on. Uh, oh, okay. Hulk level, and that's what turns him. But this, they, they wait kind of late until the movie to establish like explicitly this like uh, Bruce Banner has this power he doesn't want, and then it's like, oh, you 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 shouldn't get rid of it. You have to learn to master it, and then it's like, oh, Tim Roth and and Mister Blue are bad because they covet this power and want to exploit it. Um yeah, it's kind not, of thing. And it's it's very that needs, fuzzily that needs defined. To be introduced earlier. Yeah. And well, I, you know what would have improved the pace of this movie so much? Get rid of the terrible, boring romance plot. We don't care. Well, you know what? Keep keep the romance plot. I like a good romance. Well, just plot. make her the one that's stop. Yeah, make her the make one her that's the helping him character. treat the thing, and then you tie those two things together, and and they were. But I mean, again, like it's like like you could you can fix the romance subplot, but that would require like that that would require like going in and like reworking a lot of the movie from <laughs> the ground up. That would require giving Liv Tyler a character to play. Yeah. So how do you feel about like her being so I mentioned earlier, like being so quick to just be like, oh, you're back. I missed you. I still love you uh, with that instead of like being like, it's, y- you almost again, killed me. It comes down to the fact that she and Edward Norton just don't have on screen chemistry. They don't. They really don't. It's unfortunate. They also, they also just she and him both speak in these very like airy, light, breathy tones. Like she she's like, ah. Like, like very at the top of her voice, like breath. And again, like it's not until she starts screaming at that uh, nutty cab driver, who is I don't think I don't think people who drive cabs in New York City are that fucking. No, it's, like, that it's, guy was, it's like, just this crazy taxi. It's just this bullshit. Crazy. Whoa, wacky New York. It's like, right before that. It's that like, was just. Do you want to? You want to put me? They're looking at taking the subway. She's like, do you want to put? Edward Norton's like, do you want to put me in a crowded underground metal tube in the most aggressive city in the world? Let's take a cab. And it's like, oh, the cabbie's so great. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, like, New York doesn't, like, is it really, like, the angriest city in the world? Right? It just seems like, like. That's bull- Boston. Boston. <laughs> I would like to see, I would love to see Hulks try to survive one fucking day on the red line. Or no, not on the red line, on the green line. Yeah, because he's I, just, the Hulk. Just, yeah, green. I would, or no, I would love to see the Hulk try to survive being on the green line during a Red Sox game. Because that, like, I a couple months ago, I got caught in that, and I was like, I'm just gonna fucking throw myself onto the tracks. Goodbye. It's yeah, that I would love to see the Hulk. Let's, you know what? In addition to. We can only have a new Hulk movie if it is written and starring Neil Breen. We can only have a new Hulk movie if it takes place in Boston. Uh, yeah, I got one a, a a a new a new IP acquisition for Disney to make. What is it, Sue? Uh, the Hulk meets the Boondock Saints. Oh my God! Or yeah. <laughs> oh God, that would be. For, for, for everyone Meets, who had a, a big Boondock a, a, a Boondock Saints Goodwill Hunting Hulk crossover Boston riffic in the uh, oh and the, Mark uh, Wahlberg we gotta get Mark Wahlberg in there. oh my god has Mark Wahlberg been in any MCU stuff yet I don't I am I am I do Hold not on, I I feel like quick. if he was he would have been or, or at least Marvel no um, if if he was we it would remember it oh. Uh, I'm just seeing a few hits that said he was in talks for a future MCU project. That, that sounds, thing yeah. Is, uh, yeah, no, that's about it. Um, yeah, I guess as of like late 2020, people were saying he was in talks for a role in the MCU, which I, I assuming is just like racist Boston guy, but he can shoot lasers out of his eyes or something. I don't know. Might might be interesting to see. Um, anyways, do we want to talk about anything else about this this movie? Um, I had. I'm just trying to think if there's anything I didn't. I mean, I I had other like 
Um, I, I don't. Know, I just like like I said, like I I I I could think of like a million more like more interesting things you could do with the Hulk as a concept because it is the most compelling concept they've got by far. But that would just be that that, that would just be me describing screenplay ideas, which is probably just the absolutely most compelling podcast material anyone can think of. Um, I, I think for the movie itself, I think that's about it. Like there's not, mo- yeah, most of what's interesting about it is what it isn't, I guess. Um, yeah. And, for, and again, the behind the scenes. Yeah. The, the fact that both stopped. of these introductory MCU movies were messes and it's just Iron Man managed to come together around Robert Downey Jr., and uh, Hulk did not come together around Edward Norton. Um, well, here's the thing: if you want to know, oh, my, I'm sorry, my my lights. Uh, so you cut out. Are you still there? Weirdly, for a second. But yeah, the Hulk is what would happen if Iron Man did not have Robert Downey Jr. Hello. Whoops. Uh oh. Um. Just for uh, editing purposes, I'm still here. Nicole's audio cut out. Uh, so yeah, just uh, just just waiting. Uh, I've got Nicole on text. Her router went out. She's gonna be. Oh, there she is. I was I was just I was just narrating into Audacity for uh for our editor um for our producer um. Well, it's okay, I'm mine's... back. Okay, okay, we're I'm good. Back. All right. Um. Okay. Yeah. Let's just. Let's just skip to what you should watch instead of The Incredible Hulk 2008. Um, it's not Ang Lee Hulk because I haven't seen it. Uh, yeah, um, I, from I'm, what I remember of it, you're not missing a lot. So um. Yeah. Um, and I know I had said I was going to recommend JoJo's instead, which I guess I could still recommend just instead of watching the MCU, just get into JoJo's. There you go. Instead. Yeah. It'll, it'll scratch all the it's, same itches, but with just a lot more artistic in- integrity and style. It, it, artistic integrity, uh, more fashion moments. It's way gayer. more fashion moments. Oh yeah. Super gay. Um, I, I always love it when it's like, there's an enemy stand user somewhere around here and there's like a bunch of normal looking people. Who is it? And then one guy dressed like Prince. <laughs> <laughs> one, yeah there's just one guy wearing like seven belts yeah who could it be um but i um yeah in addition to recommending jojo's which also do not fucking skip parts do not skip parts one and two what the fuck is wrong with you this no fuck you don't part two is skip great part two is so much fun part two is great i love people Joseph. who want to skip He's, part two he cheated on, on his blue. wife but i love him um, but I am going to recommend uh, Ken Russell's Altered States, which also stars William Hurt, who plays General Ross in Hulk. Um, and in Altered States, uh, William Hurt is a scientist who is doing experiments on himself um, and ends up unlocking like dormant evolutionary genes. And he basically turns into like a weird ape man at the climax of the movie. Uh, it's really great. It's really, it's got that, you know, on brand Ken Russell fucking weird, like sequences and surrealism, um, would be a five star movie, but I had to take a half star off because William Hurt, like eight man kind of reminded me a little too much of Jim Carrey Grinch, which I am, I, that is a movie I'm looking forward to rewatching this season because I, oh my God. You know what? We, we <laughs> that should do fucking movie. Maybe that should be one of our first bonus or side series episodes. Cause I caught, the Grinch. I caught part Jim of, Grinch. I caught part of that while oh, um, the, yeah. my, my niece was watching it in the background while I was uh, visiting was with my family. It's, it's bad, but I think it's bad in kind of interesting ways. Cause it's got like really out there production design. It's, it's got that, there, there's an energy late that like turn of the century, turn of the millennium blockbusters have where they're just like doing everything. Like nothing is too wacky or out there to be shoved into a movie. Um, And and I always, I, I find those kind of interesting now because they seemed like normal movies when I was a kid, but now, you know, being older, having seen decades of film after decades of film before they, they stand out. Uh, even if not especially the bad ones, is being like, holy shit, what's going on here? They they they, they threw a hundred well, million Jim dollars Grinch at this. Is like that movie is has no reason being as horny as it is. 
That is yeah. a horny movie. No, there's there, there, there there's a, a horny one of the movie. bits I saw. They're like the Grinch's origin. He drifts down from the sky in a baby basket, but it's it's framed as a character telling a story to a little kid. So it might be like, like, like even within the movie itself, it might not really work that way. And then it's like yeah. what yeah. they they show one of the baskets drifting down to a who house, and a guy walks and out. A key party. And he, and he, Oh no, the key party comes after when the Grinch is hanging yeah. outside the window. Oh, yeah. But before that, just a normal Who baby drifts down in its umbrella basket to a Who's house. And oh, a guy yeah. opens the door and he picks it out and he's like, Honey, <laughs> our baby arrived. He looks just like your boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's this in this movie. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, then there's also the part, again, like bonus episode we don't we don't talk about any mcu movies we just talk about jim carrey ron howard grinch yeah i mean honestly, we, i just I've, talked I've... for fucking half an hour about how martha may fucking huvier okay lana del rey wants to sit on that green hairy grinch cock so fucking badly like yeah, it's it's, it's, it's obscene crazy. it's obscene We've... and then there's the part <laughs> where they're literally force feeding the grinch and it is filmed like a fetish video oh it's so gross i've 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 been having so much fun doing this. I was thinking like, yeah, we can have, we can totally just like have outside the main thrust episodes and just talk about whatever movies just catch our fancy without, we'll just, we'll call the whole series, watch something else or something. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. But I've been, I've been pondering <laughs> that. Be the, the Christmas bonus episode. We just watched the fucking Jim Carrey Grinch or actually I would also speak in Jim Carrey Grinch. Uh, haven't seen it in a while, but the cat in the hat movie that, with Mike Myers. That movie also very cursed. Is that, everything that's insane about the Jim Carrey Grinch movie is cranked to 11. I, I saw that movie once when I was a kid. I was just, I was getting, a, I was a bit too old for it, but it was like my sister rented it or, or something. Um, and I remember watching it and I was just like, this is insane. It's like melting my, I like it's, it. I'm melting my brain cells. It's, uh, it, the, it's got great it, it almost feels design. it almost feels like Freddie like a Freddie got fingered kind of thing. Almost. Yeah, it's so uh, out it's, there. It stars uh, now uh, certified murderer Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Who? Uh, there's there's we have fucking Mrs. Kwan. What other movie has Mrs. Kwan? I don't know any. Sorry, who's a certified yeah. murderer? Alec Baldwin. Oh, Alec Baldwin's in that. Oh, right. As I. I misheard you. Alex Baldwin literally killed right on the, a woman yeah. last month. I, I and miss, he literally went on ABC and was like, "I didn't do it." I forgot Alec Baldwin was was in that. I was just saying it's got. Yeah, um, he's the bad guy. Yeah, he's the bad guy in in the cat the hat. That that would be maybe we'll 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 make it a two for just Gonzo live action Doctor Seuss uh, millennial yeah, adaptations. Once, yeah, and then yeah, I guess I think. The cat in the hat was when they were like, "Okay, we need to stop this. We're we're exclusively doing like this is animation now." And then that oh god, that's the fucking that illumination yeah. Grinch because I caught part of that too, most of that too. In the in the background, I was like, I was barely watching it, but my niece was watching it, and it's it's just do- like like the the Jim Carrey Grinch <laughs> is not a good <laughs> movie, but it's weird and it's got pro- like crazy production design. That Illumination movie is just, yeah, I said dog sass. It's, it's just, it's nothing. I've, I've, it's got- honestly, I've been thinking about that for the past 48 hours. Like, man, this is dog sass. I, I feel like that's an unfair comparison to dog's asses. At least there's something kind of interesting potentially going on there in as, comparison as who looks to an Illumination a good movie. good amount of dog's asses, yeah. Um, um, do not take that out of context. I That is... I work in an animal. It's hospital. an it's noble it's noble necessary work. It's a noble it's um, a noble profession. Uh, but uh, but yeah, yeah just uh, every watch every illumination movie is just there's nothing there's nothing there. They drive me insane. They're so bad. They're but voids. yeah, watch please watch watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. Watch Altered States by Ken Russell. Hell, watch Jim Carrey Grinch or Mike Myers Cat in the Hat. <laughs> You'll have a lot more fun watching those than watching the Incredible I, I'm gonna, Hulk. I'm going to say just at, like, because I don't want to, I mean, not, not that anything we do is really going to matter one way or the other, but like, I, I, I don't want to, if I can contribute to feeding the beast, like you don't, you don't need to, you've already seen these movies. You don't need to watch them again. Don't spend money on them. Don't give Disney your money. Um, Please. They don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is ultimately like the project here and it, it, it's it, the early movies because they're kind of real movies still. There's not as much to say about it, but as we go on, it's like th- th- this, this hum- algorithmic homogenization of culture is kind of the real 
at least for me, the, the, the kind of the real target that initially made me want to do this show. Um, but uh, as for something else to watch, I, I'm kind of stumped on this one because I don't know what exactly fits here. Um, in line with your recommendation of Altered States, I was thinking uh, uh, an, all, an all-time classic where, where you get a, a, a quirky leading actor, some actual sexual energy and charisma, mad mad science and inner stuff coming out. And that's uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly. Yeah. Which is oh, which is an, Cronenberg. All which is just a fantastically Still gross so movie. Though. It rules. So dis- <laughs> not not my favorite Cronenberg movie. That that would go to Videodrome. Actually, yeah. Um, we, but, uh, t- I mean, unrelated to anything in this, also watch Videodrome. Um, video Videodrome is just like one of those one of those like my favorite genre prescient movies. Very prescient. I, I think very prescient. Um. Uh. Uh, Debbie Harry is in it. She plays a girl named Nikki, and she's, she's really hot. She is so hot in that movie; it's unreal. She's so pretty. Um, yeah, definitely. Def- James yeah, James I would, Woods I would love perfectly to cast as just a skeezy piece as of shit. Himself, <laughs> yeah. As himself, as himself, as himself, as is like that movie perfectly predicted his Twitter feed, like perfectly. Yeah, that. Oh, um, I've ever seen um, Cop. 1988. No. Uh, no. That, that is the perfect James Woods movie. You, you should. He you plays should, a cop. I'm guessing. He, he does. He should. Abs- it's 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 both like, in even within the context of the movie, he's like a bad guy and like crazy misogynistic and violent. He 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 straight up murders a guy in a car who's like a gangster or sold a car or something, and then takes the girl the guy was with home. Yeah, he's he's a total sleaze in this movie. It's outrageous. So it's it's like, but it's also like like the movie knows he's a bad guy, but also it's just like a deeply reactionary movie. There's a lot of like, what's the deal with with women and feminism and and they're all so messed up in yeah. the head. These these broads. It's it's incredible. Absolutely, absolutely. Watch cop. It's uh, that uh, sounds, it rules. Yeah, I love I love those stupid like yeah any sort of movie that would like get like a good rich evans laugh on like bass of the worst is something i'm very interested it's it, it in is saying. like it's a mix of genuinely great and just like so outrageously reactionary it's comical it's it's a it's a really solid watch um i i guess yeah i mean that's i think that's a a lot of record they're all kind of divergent from the a, a core material I, i'm trying to think is there anything that like if there's an itch this movie attempts to scratch what would really scratch it and i'm you know i'm gonna say play uh play a video game just go if you can find an em- get an emulator working or something yeah. play that that hulk ultimate destruction game that's a hoot um and i just yeah i hope someday maybe the mcu falls apart someone can do something with this i mean I'm, normally i'm a like just just let characters die and just make your own thing inspired by them. That's not a licensed trapped by a franchise, or whatever. But I honestly think there is, and I'm curious if anyone, if anyone wants to DM me, recommend me if there's any good Hulk comics that ever managed to go there, but like something that like could actually tap into what's genuinely potentially interesting about this character. Cause so far um, most of this attempt to, to translate Hulk stuff to animation or the big screen kind of completely misses I feel like fails so totally fails to realize all the potential that's kind of in the concept. Um, oh, and read yeah. read Leaf Extraordinary Gentleman and 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 and, and watch the the, <laughs> the Mister Hyde rape the Invisible Man to death. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If you're if you're a sicko like both of us, uh, that that should pique your interest. Um, yeah. So I guess next time we'll be back and watching Iron Man two. Uh, well, I was uh, thinking, cause yeah. we're still, before we leave 2008, we might want to do The Dark Knight. Okay. Um, as, cause, cause I do want to look at, even setting aside side series or, or whatever we do, whatever, if we do that, um, which I'd like to, uh, I want to look at other parallel attempts to build franchises or respond to Marvel or that shape okay. the same pheno- uh, phenomena. So I do want to look at. The, even though the Dark Knight is kind of a part of a contained trilogy, it set it really set the tone for what the non Marvel, like the DC counter Marvel thing would be. Sort of like if Marvel's over here being all light and fun, yeah. Like we're gonna we're gonna double down on the Nolan stuff with uh, the Zack Snyder yeah. movies and and everything, 
And then, and, then in yeah. Suicide Squad, they turned oh, into a not, they turned into a music video not, at the last we are minute. Not watching and, su- we are not watching Suicide Squad. I'm sorry, we're not watching Suicide. The, Maybe the Suicide Squad I hear is interesting, but I saw Suicide Squad in theaters. Thank God I got free tickets. I didn't buy those. We are not watching Suicide Squad. It, you know what? I, I maybe will talk about it, but like you don't have to watch it again. I've never seen it. Okay. Um, oh, you haven't. You're but I, not I feel anything. like it's if we're looking at these things as as symptomatic and reflective of culture. Like, I mean that that movie I feel like was huge with the the uh, just emerging Zoomer demographic and has it was really the launch pad for Harley Quinn to kind of become her own brand. Um, I, I love the Harley Quinn movie that that is like the DC finally was like, we're going to remake Tank Girl. And they did. And it's I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, but man. Yeah, no, Tank Girl. That's a that's a film that that's <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, but yeah, The Dark Knight, I think. Yeah, we can definitely watch The Dark Knight next because that is I mean, that's like number 18 on like the top like. 200 letterboxed it was it was Jeez, this is number so, this one is like it was number one on pop. imdb for a few years a after long, it came yeah, out for um, a long time. and i i haven't seen it and i remember when it came out loving it like everybody else did um and i'm curious how i'll feel about it now where i'm like actually the best batman movie is batman returns because it's outrageous um yeah, and I'm Michelle, well. Michelle Pfeiffer is also like really. She hot is too. actually because we did my old podcast. We did a, a movie episode on Batman uh, Returns and Batman eighty nine. And Batman Returns is the far better film than eighty nine. Yeah, um, I, I haven't seen the original Batman. Uh, you know, it's worth watching. So it's still got some of that good production design. Jack Nicholson's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, um, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer in in Batman Returns. She's Holy up. shit! Just love it. A vibe. What, what of a, absolute queen shit? It a rules. Vibe, a um, also, a, a also, you ever notice in It's Always Sunny how periodically they'll just have Danny DeVito just be the penguin, just get really gross <laughs> yeah. and be the penguin and it's do the gargly so voice. Disgusting! And everything. That's disgusting. <laughs> he's he's so man. gross in that movie. It's awesome. It's he's, I love it. Actually, yeah, watch Batman Returns. That's a in, in an era. It's a very different approach to superhero stuff that is kind of refreshing in context of what it, what's been the norm for the last like 15 years. Cause it's really, it's weird and out there. It's also got really great production design um, and fantastic sets. Um, even if the, the actual action is kind of like stiff and awkward. Um, yeah. It's a hoot. Uh, anything else you wanted to say or promote? Just uh, be on the lookout. I'll have a top like, through the arts views, the website I write for, that my top 10 of 2021 will be coming out. Uh, Take a wild guess what my number one is, but uh, that'll be coming out soon. I'll also be reviewing the new uh, Guillermo del Toro movie when that comes out. So that's on my agenda. Um, Do you have anything to plug, Stu? Uh, Like Twitter, or maybe I'll put a link in the description. There's a website where I occasionally post up uh, some of my short fiction when I work up the nerve to make it public. Uh, that's about it. Uh, as always, it has been a pleasure and I am super looking forward to doing the next one with you. And thank Yay. you. Thank you everybody for listening. Uh, special thanks to um, Miguel Tanny, who's been uh, graciously providing editing and production for us so far. And uh, to um, uh, Liz IRL on Twitter, who is providing some, uh, as of this recording, still forthcoming uh, uh, thumbnail art uh, for the show. Um, I just I wanted to get at least two recorded before I started uploading, so we didn't have too big of a gap. Thank you for listening, everybody, and good night, good day, goodbye, whatever time it is. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>